Can you guys hear me back there? All good? Okay. Okay, my name is Keanu, and um, I want to thank uh, Shane and uh, Tim for bringing myself and uh, Lawrence up here. Uh, both he and I, we teach at the University of Hawaii. Uh, as Lawrence was sharing, there's a lot of really, really good research coming out, and it's actually undermining a lot of information we thought we knew. Yeah? So if anything, it's not a time to talk about history. It's now it's a time to learn history because things that are coming out now are completely changing the way we're thinking. Uh, especially when you're dealing with a country, a country that we call the Hawaiian Kingdom. Now when I refer to the Hawaiian Kingdom, I'm not referring to a sovereignty group. I'm referring to a country that was established by King Kamehameha I back in 1810. So that country of the Hawaiian Kingdom is what I'm making reference to. My PhD is in political science. Uh, I specialize in international relations and public law. When I first went up to the University of Hawaii, this was January of 2001. This was just coming back from the Netherlands, from the permanent court of arbitration. And while we're at the court, which I'll cover later in a bit more detail, we had a meeting in Brussels, Belgium, with the ambassador from Rwanda, who was at the court in The Hague, because he attended a hearing across the hall at the International Court of Justice regarding Belgium and an arrest warrant for the Minister of Congo, Minister of Foreign Affairs from Congo for war crimes, genocide, mass murder. So he was up there and he asked if he could meet with us because he accessed all the records from the court, which was across the hall. So when we met with him in Brussels, Belgium, after we caught the train, we were picked up by a motorcade from the Rwandan embassy, taken to a meeting that he had with other ambassadors Back then it was called the Organization of African States, which later came to be known as the African Union, similar to the European Union. And he introduced himself to us after his assistant brought us to him. He excused himself from the meeting and he said, please follow me. So myself and my legal team walked with the ambassador to a little cafe, and this was right across the street. And that cafe was actually closed because I found out later Rwanda had paid for the cafe to be closed for two hours, so nobody's in there. So he knocked on the door, the, the manager greets him, lets us in, the manager closes the door, locks it, pulls the shades down, turns on the lights, and we have coffee ready for us. And he says to me that his government has reviewed all the pleadings in the case and it is clear Hawaii is occupied, and this cannot be tolerated. Because he said Rwanda understands what happens when international law is violated, and the international community does not step in until it's too late. And he's talking about mass murder, genocide. Close to 800,000 people were slaughtered. This was between the Hutus and the Tutsis, okay? This ambassador was a Tutsi survivor, Dr. Bio Zagawa. That's who this guy was. So then he says that his government, from the president, through the Minister of Foreign Affairs, to him, offered to us that Rwanda is prepared to report to the United Nations General Assembly the prolonged occupation of Hawaii and bring it to an end. That's what he told us. This was December of 2000. I asked him so I could have a meeting, just a short pause, to meet with my legal team. I turned around, we started to talk, and we came to a decision. So I sat back down in front of the ambassador, and I said, please convey to your president our sincere gratitude, but we cannot accept this offer at this time because our people back home have no clue of our status under international law. And we cannot allow Rwanda to hold up Hawaii when our people back home can't even stand on their own. 
because we've all been victimized by brainwashing. We're led to believe something that's not true. We knew that. So he said, we need, we need to go home and begin re-education. And then Dr. Bill Zagawa, the ambassador, thanks me. He goes, no, he says, thank you. I said, no, thank you. But our work is cut out for us. See, I attended the University of Hawaii to get my bachelor's degree. I was there from 1984 to 1987. And I know what they're teaching. I took those classes and it's wrong, completely wrong. Too much blame the Haole for everything. You know, blame the missionaries. Don't explain, blame. Well, we're in a court where you don't blame, you address issues procedurally, legally, factually, historically. So I knew what they were teaching. So it was decided that once we got home in December, I was going to enter the University of Hawaii Political Science Department, and that was January of 2001, the very next month. And that's when I went head to head with professors that are teaching Hawaii's history that I knew is wrong, but I'm not gonna argue, because you still gotta be respectful. I'm only a graduate student. But I'm gonna basically provide them the facts and the evidence through research, writing term papers, papers that have footnotes, theory, methodology, all that stuff. Let history tell us what happened. Enough us telling history what happened. And that's what led me to get my master's degree specializing in international relations, and then ultimately my PhD in political science. While I was there at the university, what I wanted to do was to initiate and continue this research because we're gonna re-enter the international community, but we're gonna do it on our terms. Not because I'm gonna do it to try to prove something. I don't need to prove anything. I just gotta make sure it's done right. My tutu always told me, you're gonna do something, you better not do it kapulu. Yeah? Do it right or don't do it at all. And sometimes you gotta step back and you're going, Okay, let me make sure I got everything in line before I step up. That's when I started the Hawaiian Society of Law and Politics with Shane. Shane was in the PhD program in psychology. Kalavaya Moore, PhD program in political science. And Kumelo Hagoms created an organization for students called the Hawaiian Society of Law and Politics to encourage additional research that's multidisciplinary, not just in political science, history, anthropology, yeah, law. Start promoting the publishing of law articles. Start publishing the uh, publication of just basic articles that are peer review, law review. See, it's in the academic world, you don't argue your point, you gotta defend it. And when you write an article, you gotta submit it to an editorial board that actually, what their job is to break it. It's called peer review or law review. If you pass that, you get it published. That's how that process works at the university. So I'm, I'm pretty glad that since I left the university, this has continued. And Lawrence is a prime example that here is a PhD student or candidate who's about to graduate, and he's from Germany. And what you folks may not know, that guy speaks a lot of languages. German, English, French, Hawaiian, Tongan, Samoan, Tahitian, anything else, Lawrence? Okay, amazing these guys from Europe. <laughs> so Lawrence, what he has is the ability to, to read French and German, so that means he can go into the archives in Belgium that Hawaii had a treaty with, and he can pull all this stuff up in the French language diplomatic records, yeah? In Switzerland, German, they speak, in Zurich. He can pull this stuff up. When he's in Germany itself, you know, so what's good about this information, it's not, it's not a native issue. This is a world issue, because Hawaii, like Lawrence shared, had over 90 embassies and consulates all over the world. We're just, we're just tapping into the tip of the iceberg over here. Imagine the history that's going to take place around the world, which has already started. And it's all starting to speak along the same lines of international law, international relations, and the status that Hawaii had and that it still has. So my part of this presentation might be reviewing some of the things that, that Lawrence touched upon, but you know, repetition is good after a while. 
Okay. But I have my own style of presenting. And what I'm going to cover here is Hawaii, an independent state under occupation. I'm not a political guy. I'm not into getting people to hold signs. In fact, I'm a retired captain from the Army, so I'm a very no-nonsense kind of guy. I don't operate on he said, you said, I said, we all said. I say, what you said, go back it up, and if not, go out there and go check. It's called get the intel. You know, give me one salute report. You know, I don't want to hear you embellish the story. Just tell me what happened. Then I know how we're going to have to fight them. Yeah? So that's the approach I take. You know, one thing that I learn that I apply constantly is the practical value of history is that it's a film of the past run through the projector of today onto the screen of tomorrow. That film never changes, but your projector has to get updated. And right now, our projector is getting updated. And when you update the projector, you can process more film. When you process more film, now you see something you didn't see before. And that's what's coming out through all this research. So it's really an exciting time where, man, it's, it's spreading, like Lawrence touched upon in Switzerland. I'm actually involved in that case. Yeah? So I know all the background details, and it's pretty mind-blowing, but you got to talk that international language. And it's a different language than how we talk normally. Yeah? So these are the kind of things that, um, that, that I'm a part of. I still teach at the university, and I also sit on doctoral committees as well. So I can tell you firsthand, people like Lawrence and Donovan Preza and others, the type of research that is coming out, wow. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and that's the beauty of this whole thing. So we can actually look to our kupuna and thank them for securing what we now are just realizing it's already secured. We just got to take time to understand it. Yeah. So here we go. We're going to talk about terminology. Because you know, a lot of times, as local people, we make up words. You guys know that, huh? <laughs> we make up words all the time for the sake of communicating. Okay? One example of making up a word in order to communicate. Here's a story that happened with my dad that I shared in other presentations. But my dad must have been about 15, 20 years ago. And I told him about this show I saw on A&E, the channel A&E, about the giant squid. Okay? So I said, hey, daddy, they're trying to find this giant squid 30 feet long. But they're only finding the legs. And the legs are like 20 feet. But they can't find the live one. But I told him the sperm whale with the teeth, that's the predator of the giant squid. And then they found out, and what they tried to do was put a camera on the dorsal fin of the sperm whale to track it when it goes after the giant squid. So I'm telling this story, and I'm just sharing with him what happened on TV, because it was kind of interesting. And he looked at me with this look on my face like, what the hell are you talking about? like I was telling him on Ghost Story. I was like, Dad, it was on TV. They're talking about the giant squid. And he went, what? I was like, oh, okay, wait, something's wrong over here. <laughs> and then I started to think, my dad, during the summer on Oahu, he used to uh, sleep, uh, stay with my Auntie Dana, and he used to go poke squid, right? Kahalu. And he used a squid box to poke the squid for the squid luau. So I said, Dad, describe to me one squid. And he described to me an octopus. You know there's a difference, right? Squid lives open ocean. Yeah? Octopus lives on the reef. So I'm telling my dad this story. He thought when sperm whale in Kahalu going after one octopus in the reef, and he's holding the squid box. <laughs> In Hawaiian, the word for squid is muhe'e. Octopus is he'e. In Japanese, the word squid is ika, and the octopus is taco. But today, every local person says that's squid luau, but that's not squid in the luau. And if you try to put squid in the luau, people are going to say, what the hell is that? Bruh, that's squid. Look like calamari. So... That's just one example of us, be, we got to be careful who we're talking to. 
Yeah? And don't confuse the octopus with the squid, especially if you're in the world court. Yeah? <laughs> or you're talking to the ambassador from Rwanda. <laughs> the guy's going to look at you. This guy's nuts. <laughs> so we're going to get into some terminology so we can understand it because what I hear in the community and at the university is a lot of squid when it's actually octopus. Okay? And one of the squids is actually called a state. <laughs> that term right there, state. So a state is a country, a country that is internationally recognized. That's different from a nation. So a nation basically is where you have a people that have a common culture, language, history. That's a nation. So examples of nation, uh, Scotland, okay, Scottish, that's a nation, Irish, that's a nation, Choctaw, Navajo. Yeah, those are nations, but not every nation is a state. You got to be recognized. So the United Kingdom of Great Britain is a state made up of different nations. Scotland, yeah, Wales, England, and Northern Ireland. That's why it's called the United Kingdom, but that's a state made up of nations. So when we talk about a state, a state got to be recognized. You cannot just say, I'm a state. Palestine was trying that. It didn't work. Until 2012, they were recognized as a state by the General Assembly, the other members of the United Nations. So what is a state? First of all, a state, it has equal rights and duties and are co-equal members of the international community regardless of their economic, social, or political differences. So give you an example. The state, the independent state of Luxembourg, Luxembourg in Europe, Luxembourg is the size of Oahu. Liechtenstein is the size of Molokai. Russia is a very huge state. But according to international law, Luxembourg and Liechtenstein are just as equal to Russia as Russia is equal to them despite the size difference. That's what that means. This is from international law. Okay. Now, states are politically independent. Now, this is the word that everybody tends to misuse. That's the octopus. Yeah, that's the octopus that people are calling squid. Independent means that you are, that your legal system exists independently over your territory to the exclusion of other legal systems that exist over their territories. That's what independence means. Okay. It's a political term. It's not physically being independent. It means when somebody enters the territory of that country, let's say France, everyone is subject to French law. Even if you're an American, Russian, German, Norwegian, or Hawaiian. That's independence. Okay? Now back in the 1800s, you had countries that weren't independent. One example is Japan. So Japan was not independent because you had other laws that were applied in Japanese territory. So the British, and that's why I remember when Lawrence was mentioning Japan in, the, in that uh, map, Japan was not part of the family of nations. Well, it was under the emperor, but the rest of the world, the countries, the independent states of Europe did not recognize Japan's independence, meaning Japanese law over everybody. What it did was it said, if a British subject gets into trouble in Japan, he can only be prosecuted not by Japanese law, but by British law. And that prosecution can only take place by the British consulate in Tokyo that serves as a court. And he can only be punished under British law. That is an indication that Great Britain does not recognize Japan's independence. They are not going to subject British subjects to Japanese law because they were concerned they're not going to be treated well. Now what people don't realize, and Lawrence brought this out in his research that he shared with me, King Kalakaua had a meeting in 1881 with the Japanese emperor in Japan when Kalakaua was traveling the world. And that emperor asked King Kalakaua, in recognizing the status of Hawaii as an independent state, 
would you be the first power to recognize Japan's independence and rescind consular jurisdiction so that Hawaiian subjects can only be prosecuted by Japanese law if they get in trouble. Because up to that point in 1881, if a Hawaiian subject in Japan gets into trouble, he can only be prosecuted under Hawaiian kingdom law and prosecuted and heard by the Hawaiian consulate in Tokyo, just like Great Britain. That's pretty heavy when you think about it. So here's the emperor of Japan asking Kalako, hey, can you help me? Can you be the first power to start that ball rolling? Kalakaua did not follow through because he ran into some political problems when he came home. But did you know it was his sister, Queen Lili Ukalani, that actually notified the Hawaiian ambassador in January of 1893 to recognize Japan's independence. All this time, everybody thought it was Great Britain that recognized Japan's independence in 1894 was actually the Hawaiian Kingdom in 1893. And that's coming out now in research. I just, uh, back in September, I was at a, uh, a conference that was invited. I was invited to this conference at the University of Cambridge in England. And I was there amongst 15 scholars from, who were invited from around the world on non-European powers. And I was there to present on Hawaii as a non-European power. And when I shared this portion of Hawaii's history, these guys were blown away. Blown. Because they didn't, they couldn't believe the status that Hawaii had at that time. Amazing. But you know, I had a lot of fun presenting it because I can honestly say up there, I was proud to be Hawaiian. Oh, big time. I had fun. You know, it's like, hey, you think that's something here? How's about this one? You know, but those are the kind of things that are getting very exciting in the academic world. You know, it's like you're going through a treasure chest and you're pulling up something going, wow, gee, I never know Tutu had this. You know, that's, that's the exciting part. So what's important again, states that are, states have what is called independence, which is a political term. Keep that in mind, okay? Also, states are represented by governments in the exercise of their rights. This is another aspect you gotta understand. You gotta separate between what is called state sovereignty and the government. Governments are not sovereign. States are sovereign. Sovereignty by definition is supreme authority over territory. That's all it means. But you need a government to exercise that authority. Yeah? That's why governments are separate. Okay? You gotta separate the two. And the reason why you gotta separate the two one country can overthrow a government without overthrowing the country. Iraq, 2003. United States military overthrew the Iraqi government, militarily, called shock and awe. That did not mean Iraq ceased to exist as a country was still a sovereign and independent state and only Iraqi law applied, not American law. But we'll get into that with regard to Hawaii's history. So, when did Hawaii become an independent state. See, now you folks understand independence now, right? That's octopus, that's not squid. Anglo-French proclamation. Both the British and the French signed off, jointly recognizing the Hawaiian Islands as an independent state. So it says that both foreign nations have thought it right to engage reciprocally to consider the Sandwich Islands, which later was known as the Hawaiian Islands, as an independent state. Now, what is the significance of that is that Great Britain and France recognizes only Hawaiian law applies over Hawaiian territory, and any French citizen or British subject in Hawaiian territory is under Hawaiian law. That's what that means. That's what that means, okay? That's why countries like Palestine were trying to be recognized as an independent state where all you have is Palestinian law, not a combination of Israeli law, Palestinian law, and other laws. That's the importance. So what Timoteo Ha'alilio and William Richards and Sir George Simpson achieved in 1843 is profound. And this right here on November 28 was Hawaii's birth into the family of nations. It was at this time in 1843 that Hawaii 
was the first non-European country to be brought into the European family. Japan, Ottoman Turks, Persia, which is Iran, China, Japan, they didn't get in until 1899. Here's Hawaii in 1843. That's interesting. But you know these, these uh, envoys, they played Great Britain and France against each other because they didn't like each other, so they played them. Yeah, and they also played America. So on July 6, 1844, Secretary of State John C. Calhoun notifies the Hawaiian government that the actions taken in the Sandwich Islands were regarded by the president as full recognition on the part of the United States of the independence of the Hawaiian government. Again, can you understand, even the United States now says only Hawaiian law applies in Hawaiian territory and every American who is in Hawaii is subject to Hawaiian law. They cannot claim protection from American law, like how an American could do in Japan, until 1899. Yeah. So very profound, and that day, November 28, is Independence Day, La Kuokoa. That's the national holiday in the kingdom, that's the birthday. So I would recommend everyone here, do not celebrate Thanksgiving on November 28 because that's an American holiday. You didn't have pilgrims in Hawaii being assisted by Native Americans surviving a winter. <laughs> Celebrate Independence Day, yeah? That's how it's supposed to be. But you can still eat your turkey, and put, but put it in the emu. <laughs> now, independence is right here. This is from the Hawaiian Civil Code. Chapter six, it says the laws are obligatory, meaning you're obligated upon all persons, whether subjects of this kingdom or citizens or subjects of any foreign state while within the limits of this kingdom, except so far as exception is made by the laws of nations in respect to ambassadors. That's from the Civil Code of 1859. You notice how it applies to everybody. That's because of independence. You wouldn't find this in Japan prior to 1899 because foreigners will be under their own laws. Yeah. And it also says the property of all such persons, while such property is within the territorial jurisdiction of the kingdom, is also subject to the laws. This is independence. A lot of, a lot of time you hear people saying, hey, I'm for independence. No, no, Hawaii's already independent. It's just that that independence is not being complied to. Yeah? That's the difference. So again, we gotta understand how to use these terms. Now, what happened in 1893 was just an illegal overthrow admitted by the United States of the Hawaiian government. That's all it was. It was not an overthrow of the Hawaiian kingdom as a country. Okay, so it's no different than Iraq. Now, how could 30 people take over an entire country? that had over 90 embassies all over the world and consulates, fully constitutional, very progressive. Even you had former slaves escaping the South from the United States, they came here, became naturalized Hawaiian subjects. Yeah, Hawaii was welcoming all kind of people, right? But how can 30 people take over an entire country? In political science, we call it regime change. All you do is it's called, uh, you got an airplane, okay, this airlines is called Hawaiian Airlines, yeah? And it's flying in the sky real high because sovereignty with American Airlines, British Airlines, French Airlines, flying. The only thing they took over in this airlines was the pilot. It's called regime change. All they changed was Queen Lili Ukalani, the chief executive and her cabinet. Replaced them with criminals called insurgents led by Sanford Dole Okay, and then protect them in the cockpit while the plane is still flying. And then they basically tell everybody who works for Hawaiian Airlines, you gotta sign oaths of allegiance. Oaths of allegiance to this new regime. And if you don't sign it, you're gonna lose your job or you're gonna be put in prison. And who's gonna force this? The US military presence. Well, this is the Royal Hawaiian Band. Okay, it's a government agency. They work for Hawaiian Airlines, okay? And this band 
refused to sign the Oath of Allegiance. This is the Oath of Allegiance. They got to sign it. And it says that I, in this case, Arthur Ashford Wilcock, no, Wilder, okay, a native of the Hawaiian Islands, residing in Honolulu, age 19 years old, in said district, do solemnly swear in the presence of Almighty God that I will support the provisional government of the Hawaiian Islands, proclaimed on January 17, 1893. Members of the, the band refused to sign and end up losing their job. So they went to Mrs. Prendergast, a lady in waiting for Queen Lili Okalani, and they asked her to compose a song that's, that shows their defiance. And that song is called Mele Alohaina, which is the Patriot song. Alohaina is Patriot. Later, that song came to be known as Kaulana Napua. Now, the song Kaulana Napua, which is in Hawaiian, is very uh, chalangalang now, yeah? Real chalangalang. And they play it in Safeway. But see, nobody, a lot of us don't speak Hawaiian, so we don't understand the lyrics. That song was not chalangalang. That, ch that song was a hula kui, like the haka. That's how it was. But in 1970s, they changed the melody. So they can keep the lyrics, yeah, but change the melody. And everybody goes, hey, that's one pretty cool song. Cyrus Green has it with the English translation. I'm going to share with you that song, both in Hawaiian and in English, and you're going to see how it's tied directly to this Oath of Allegiance. Okay, my auntie is Marlene Sai. She sings. People say, do you sing? No, I play, but I play CDs. We 
back. Le liu la la. Who has won the rights of the land. And now, we tell the story again. Until we have our lands. So you can tell that, that that song was not too cultural, yeah? I mean, don't sign the paper of the enemy with its sin of annexation and loss of civil rights. That's pretty political. What's interesting is that song plays in safe way and nobody knows what they're singing about. And they're all tapping, hey, oh, it's a nice song. Don't sign the paper of the enemy. <laughs> Which I find pretty cool. That part of Hawaii's history has lasted through a song, yeah? And that is the song, Mele Aloha the Patriot song. So in 1893, you got the sovereignty of the Hawaiian kingdom exercised by the Hawaiian government. Government is a constitutional system. All you had was a regime change, illegal overthrow, but that did not take away the sovereignty of the country. The Hawaiian kingdom still exists. January 17, 1893, without a functioning government. And that's important to know. You got to distinguish between the government and the country. Oops. So if we look at how then can the United States acquire Hawaii? So if, because Hawaii is a recognized independent state, that means international law applies, not U.S. law not Hawaiian law, international law. And international law basically is literally translated to the law between nations. Inter is between. So international law is a law between nations. So if you have a law between nations, the evidence of that relationship are agreements between the two nations, international, yeah? So one country, can convey itself to another country and join it under international law, but you need an agreement. That term to acquire the territory of another country, thereby extinguishing that former country, that word is called cession. Okay, cession. The word seed, C-E-D-E, -E, comes from the word cession. Okay. Now, according to Professor Oppenheim, he is the leading expert on international law and is constantly cited at that international level, even though he has long since died. And he says, cession of state territory is the transfer of sovereignty over state territory by the owner state to another state. And the only form in which a cession can be affected is an agreement embodied in a treaty between the ceding and the acquiring state. That's international law. Okay. So you got to get something from somebody. So here we have two sovereignties yeah, represented by their governments. One government is going to cede territory, sovereign territory, to another government embodied in a treaty. And that treaty can be voluntary. So an example of a voluntary session to the United States okay, uh, would be Louisiana Purchase, 1803, from the French. So in 1803, France ceded its territorial sovereignty to the United States, and America paid $14.5 million for that. What you have there is a contract. That's a treaty. Okay? Another example of a voluntary session, Alaska, was transferred by Russia, 1867. Okay? So you have these examples of voluntary, they negotiate. But you can also have involuntary conquest. And an example of a 
treaty transferring territory by conquest would be the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, 1848, the Mexican-American War. That's when the United States acquired all Mexican territory beyond the Rio Grande River. That's when California, Arizona, Texas, Utah, New Mexico were acquired by the United States. That's called ceded lands. Louisiana, ceded lands. Alaska, ceded lands. So you need a treaty. Well, the United States does not have a treaty with the Hawaiian Kingdom ceding anything. In fact, you had two attempts, one in 1893, which President Cleveland withdrew and never resubmitted. And then you have another treaty, 1897, where you had signature petitions, 21,000 signatures protesting, killed the treaty in 1898. By March, the treaty's dead. Not because they chose to kill it, because Hawaiian political activism made sure it was killed. They actually traveled to Washington, D.C. and lobbied all these senators who were thinking of ratifying that treaty made with insurgents. They killed it. Killed it. So up to that point, can I say the Hawaiian Islands remain an independent state? I can, right? But you see attempts to get it, but these attempts failed. Well, as a result of the Spanish-American War, on July 6, 1898, the United States Congress passed a law annexing Hawaii. And the President of the United States signed it one day later, July 7. And that began the American occupation of Hawaii. The problem is, a joint resolution of Congress is not a treaty. It's a congressional piece of legislation limited to U.S. territory. But this is what they use to occupy Hawaii because what America wanted from the very beginning, and I want to say America, the administration. It wasn't America, it was the administration. What they wanted was Pearl Harbor. They wanted Pearl Harbor in Hawaii to be a military outpost to actually protect the American West Coast from invasion, which they thought was going to come from China or Japan. That's all in the records. So their ideal is take Hawaii to protect us. The problem is you don't do that to another country unless you get a treaty. And if you don't have a treaty, it's called occupation. And this is the first U.S. military base in Hawaii, Camp McKinley. That's Kapiolani Park. That's when the rules going to change. This is not where people following law. This is called military. It's called, oh, survival. Well, what are American laws? Here's Washington, D.C. Okay. You got borders. U.S. laws have no effect beyond the borders of the United States. That's just the way it works. U.S. laws are not international law. U.S. laws are national laws that apply to the U.S. Just as Hawaiian laws are national laws that apply to Hawaii because they're independent of each other. Remember the word independence? That's the play here. What law applies over that territory? Remember the United States recognized the independence of Hawaii? Only Hawaiian law applies there, not American law. And here's what the U.S. Supreme Court says about U.S. laws. It says, the laws of no nation can justly extend beyond its own territories. They can have no force to control the sovereignty of any other nation. That's the U.S. Supreme Court, 1824. Now, why is the U.S. Supreme Court making that statement? because Great Britain and France was trying to impose their laws in U.S. territory, taking advantage of the U.S. being weak. And here's the Supreme Court says, hey, we're part of international law, remember that? And then later in 1936, the U.S. Supreme Court said, neither the Constitution nor the laws passed in pursuant of it have any force in foreign territory. And operations of the nation called the United States, in such territory must be governed by treaties, international understandings and compacts, and the principles of international law, the law between nations, not within nations. The way we've been looking at Hawaii's history, because we're led to believe something that's not true, we've been looking at Hawaii's history through the U.S. Constitution. We've been playing the game of Congress, but you can't play that game unless you're part of the United States. If you're not part of the United States, then international law kicks in. The, the issue then now is what is international law? 
And that's what we teach at the University of Hawaii. That's the type of research that's coming out, as well as knowing what is Hawaiian law, but also knowing what is American law and what are its limits. Yeah. So what is international law? Like I said, a law between nations. But what are, what are the sources of international law? Treaties, agreements. That's a source of international law, the highest level. Because international law does not have a Congress that makes law. Yeah? International law is a law between nations, the evidence of which are treaties or conventions. The second source of international law are custom. Custom, something that is accepted as law by all the rest of the countries. An example of custom is diplomatic immunity. You don't have a treaty on diplomatic immunity. It's a custom that every country knows that ambassadors have diplomatic immunity. So that's a custom. Yeah. Also, general principles of law recognized by civilized nations. Okay, one particular principle is Continuity, the, prince, the presumption of continuity, and I'll, I'll touch upon that later. But that's a principle. Basically, it's a rule of law. Also, judicial decisions from international tribunals. And the teachings of the most highly qualified publicists of the various nations. That's where, uh, remember the guy, um, uh, what's his name? Oppenheimer, Oppenheim. Oppenheim is a highly, highly qualified publicist. That's why he's cited a lot. Yeah. So these are the sources of international law. Now, national law is the law within nations. So an example of national laws would be statutes or joint resolutions in the United States, as well as judicial decisions. So another example of a law of America created by a court, but not the Congress, is the court case Roe versus Wade. Yeah? That's an example of American law. So whenever you look at Hawaii, because we're not part of the United States, you cannot look at it through statutes or joint resolutions or US Supreme Court decisions. You have to see it through international law. If it's not international law, it doesn't apply to Hawaii. So let me kind of contextualize this. Let me separate what is national laws from international laws. So this is the United States of America with its territory. Here's the Hawaiian Kingdom with its territory. But you notice they're the same size, yeah? Because they're equal, despite the fact that Hawaii's small. Just like Luxembourg and Russia. They're equal, co-equal. So the first law passed by the United States Congress was the Annexation Resolution, the Joint Resolution. That is an American law limited to U.S. territory. And the U.S. congressmen knew that. You can go back and read exactly what they're saying in the congressional record. Oh yeah, they're quite explicit. They said, we can't pass a law annexing a foreign country. Our laws have no force beyond our borders. That's what they were saying. But they still did it because they're at war with Spain. So the passing of the joint resolution would be similar to America's passing of the Patriot Act during the Iraq war. Just pass it, deal with it later. Well, for us, that joint resolution was passed because they were all caught up in war. But it's still an American law, <laughs> limited to U.S. territory. You can't get away from that one. Then, two years later, the United States Congress passed another law called the Territorial Act, the Organic Act. Now, did you know that all they did was change the name of the Hawaiian Kingdom government, kept the structure? Remember regime change, huh? You just change in a pilot. And they now call it the territory of Hawaii. And they paint Hawaiian Airlines red, white, and blue. The problem is Hawaiian Airlines is an Airbus. American Airlines is Boeing. They look different. But they're going to paint the Hawaiian Airlines, the Airbus, red, white, and blue. Because it's still flying in the air. Yeah? But people can look. Hey, that looks a little funny. That doesn't look like a Boeing. <laughs> 59 years later, the United States Congress passes another law, Statehood Act. They change the name from the territory to the state. Just name change. Same structure. Remember, hijacking. Then in 1993, the United States Congress passes another law, a joint resolution, apologizing for the illegal overthrow. 
But everybody tends to use that joint resolution as if it means something. It's an internal law of the United States. But in the apology resolution, they specifically use terminology that creates more confusion, like self-determination. Yeah, yeah. They say Native Hawaiians have a right to self-determination. Self-determination is a term that is used if you want to become your own country. So by saying Native Hawaiians have a right to self-determination, similar to Native Americans, they say you can choose what you want to be. Well, wasn't the choice already made in 1843, Hawaii's an independent state? But on top of that, it doesn't mean anything because this is an American law limited to U.S. territory. Period. But everybody uses it. Inherent sovereignty. Self-determination. Wrong. Remember, that's all squid. That's not octopus. Then, Act 195. Kana'i Without getting into any argument, is Act 195 international law? It's not a treaty. It's not a principle. It's not a court decision. The Pali Resolution, not an international law. That's not international. These are all U.S. laws passed by the U.S. Congress. And then the Native Hawaiian AHA that just finished today. See, this is where the problem arises. The Apology Resolution paints the image that only Native Hawaiians are part of a country called the Hawaiian Kingdom. And they were the only ones who were apologized, but they have a right to self-determination, which Kana'i Oluwalu was trying to facilitate in order to make an aha in saying we're a country. All of it doesn't apply. Number one, why doesn't it apply? Because it's all American law. Limited to U.S. territory. And these are Hawaiian laws that Queen Lili Okalani and our kupuna was under. Hawaiian law cannot be applied in Orange County, California, and American law cannot be applied in Lihue, because international law separates it. Remember independence? You see how important independence is? This is independence, Hawaiian law. This is American independence, U.S. law, limited to their territory. So international law is a law between. So if we had a treaty over here, that's the bridge where all these laws can come over. There's no bridge. All you have is international law regulating occupations, Hague and Geneva Conventions. That's the international law that applies. And that's at the heart of the case in Switzerland. International law, not American law, and not Hawaiian law, the law of occupation. So what's interesting about this is my training as an officer, I understood these laws of occupation to a degree because we're trained in it in the way we have to apply it. It's called Field Manual 27-10. But I had no idea that it would apply to Hawaii. No idea. And then I went, oh, so what I quickly went through, which some people are going through as well, you go from the OMG, oh my God, to the WTF. <laughs> you guys got that one? Some people are still in a WTF mode going, what? <laughs> it's called the shock and awe. <laughs> All I say is get used to it because things don't slow down. They keep picking up. Yeah. So here we talk about no treaty. Hawaii is independent. Remember the term independent? We're independent. But well, that's what we're saying now. That's what's being taught at the university. What were they thinking back then? Yeah. Well, this is Maui News. Okay, a newspaper still exists today. And this is October 20th, 1900, two years after the so-called annexation. And this guy, G.B. Robertson, this guy's an insurgent. He's a criminal. And he was not granted amnesty by Queen Lili Okalani at the request of President Cleveland because the queen was not reinstated. So they're still criminals. But he's an insurgent. He actually is an insurgent. He was part of the, the gang, you know, the sugar gang. You know, when you, these guys, they was all high on sugar. No, I mean, they was going, they was doing stupid stuff like commit treason because they high on sugar, they want profits. They're just criminals. Okay? So this guy's a criminal. 
But what ends up happening is he's going to write an editorial. This is G.B. Robertson writing about this guy, Thomas Clark. Thomas Clark. So he says here, Thomas Clark, a candidate for territorial senator from Maui, holds that it was an unconstitutional proceeding on the part of the United States to annex the islands without a treaty. Oh, brother knows something. And that as a matter of fact, the islands are not annexed and cannot be. But if the Democrats come into power, they will show the thing up in its true light and demonstrate that the islands are de facto independent at the present time. Can you now understand the context of this when you know the terminology? That means Thomas Clark knew, even G.B. Robertson knew what independence means. They put it in. So he's saying only Hawaiian law applies here, not American law. And then this is his response now. This guy, G.B. Robertson, is going to talk like he's from the U.S. State Department. Keep in mind, he's from Wailuku, Maui, yeah, who's the editor for this insurgent newspaper. He says, Thomas, necessity knows no law. So he's admitting <laughs> it's necessity. And it was absolutely necessary to annex the islands at the time it was done. And further, Thomas, if it becomes necessary to annex Cuba, it will be done quicker than a wink. It is but fair to give you credit for being honest in your views, Thomas, but you don't quite understand the American people just yet, hence you are very misleading. What is that? This is the birth of Fox News. <laughs> just keep repeating over and over until the bubble bursts. And guess what? The bubble burst already. <laughs> We're now seeing it for what it is. So obviously, who is Thomas Clark? Sound like one holy name, yeah? He obviously didn't understand the American people, so I guess Thomas is not American. Who is Thomas? How come Thomas knows there's no treaty and that Hawaii's still independent two years after so-called annexation? Well, Thomas Clark was actually one of the ones who signed the signature petition against annexation that was submitted to the United States Senate. Petition against annexation. Here we go. Thomas Clark, age 42, Hawaiian, from Wailuku, Maui. That means he knew there was no treaty. Right? And I found out that Thomas Clark, when they put Hawaiian over there, Hawaiian is a nationality, citizenship, short for Hawaiian subject. Thomas Clark's, I believe his father, was British, migrated to Hawaii, and got naturalized as a Hawaiian subject. That's him, the son, 42 years old. Because of this petition, they killed the treaty, and they all knew it. But I ask myself, as you folks should ask yourselves, how come we don't know this history about a treaty? How come we don't know this history of killing the treaty? How come we don't know this history of Thomas Clark? That brother's Hawaii, but he's Hawaiian. We always use Hawaiian like it's ethnic. Yeah? That's an American law called Hawaiian Homes Act. Hawaiian, under Hawaiian law, is a citizenship. Okay, that's octopus, not squid. <laughs> so we're going to keep using that. Well, they knew they couldn't change the minds of the adults. Okay? Which includes my great-grandfather. My great-grandparents were born in 1880, 1880s. So my great-grandfather was 13 years old in 1893. He was 18 years old in 1898. He was part of that generation that knew Hawaii still independent, but were occupied. But how come I don't know what they know? Well, my tutu's generation, anybody born after 1898, were the subject of brainwashing. And this is the program for patriotic exercises to be used in the public schools of the territory of Hawaii, 1906. This is a policy. The theme of the program was to indoctrinate the children of the Hawaiian Islands to be American and to speak English. It's pretty amazing what you read in that. I was actually contracted by the Department of Education because they're using my book, Ua Maukea, as a history book in the schools. So I had to teach the teachers how to teach Ua Maukea. Yeah? Um, one thing I learned from the army, before, the, before you train the soldiers, called train the trainer. Yeah? And I had to train the teachers. And when I gave them a copy 
of this from the Department of Education that existed in the Kingdom era to now and how it got hijacked, they read that, they could not believe what they was reading. You speak Hawaiian, you get hit. Because you got to speak English, you got to be American. All you can learn is American presidents. Yankee Doodle Dandy. Amber Ways of Grain. You know, when I was growing up, I didn't know what Amber Ways of Grain even meant. Amber, okay, brown. Wave. Well, I was, grew up by Sandy Beach. I body surf, waves. Grain. The hell, grain, waves, brown. Oh, America, you got wheat fields. Brown. When the wind blows, amber waves of grain. Oh, that's what that is. Had no clue. Somebody says, George Washington chopped down the cherry tree. I don't even know if there's a cherry tree or a cherry bush. Never seen one. Just pick them up at Safeway. Cherries. So you see that we're just taught these things without actually knowing it until you start to question it. Like, yeah. Especially when you look at Uncle Sam, who I thought was my uncle, but Uncle Sam, the tall guy with the beard, he don't look like my uncles. <laughs> he looked like one tall, holy guy from California. But we call him Uncle Sam. <laughs> I'm joking. You guys with me? You guys look too serious. I'm trying to lighten this place up. <laughs> Shock and awe. <laughs> Some of you guys look like deers with the headlights on. <laughs> it's okay because you know what? The brainwashing never, it, it, we, we, we figured it out. It was almost successful. But now it, the, the balloon just went pop. Yeah? Fox News just went pop. And now we're seeing things for what it is. Now what's in, interesting is there was a magazine that came to Hawaii from New York called Harper's Weekly Magazine in 1907. And they did a story on this brainwashing. Yeah, Harper's Weekly Magazine actually put out a story. And they visited three schools, Ka'iolani Public School, Ka'ahumanu Public School, and Honolulu High School before the name was changed to McKinley, President McKinley High School. This is 1907. So they went to... Uh, um, what do you call it? They went to Kaiolani Public School and 643 children from first grade to eighth grade. This reporter is writing out how or what takes place. So he states at the command of the principal, 643 school children from grade one through eight stand at attention. And they start marching, drilling ceremony. Yeah. The reporter is kind of tripping out because the, the, the precision of the marching. They're all in sync. Young kids. I was in the army. I saw guys with two left feet can't even march. These are children in precision. Then they all line up in front of the American flag and at the command of the principal they salute. That's how they salute back then. Until Hitler hijacked it. Then everybody went like that. <laughs> this is actually a salute that came from Rome. Yeah, so that, there was nothing wrong with that until Hitler got hold of it. But this is how they saluted. So they took a picture of the children. So this is my tutu's generation from Harper's Weekly Magazine. And it says what they yell in unison. We give our heads and our hearts to God and our country. One country, one language, one flag. This, show, this scene shows the salute to the American flag, which flies in the Ameri on the grounds of the Kaiolani Public School, which has many Japanese. The drill is constantly held as a means of inculcating patriotism in the hearts of the children. That word inculcate, that's called indoctrinate through repetition. That's what inculcate means. Wow. What came out of that? They're not speaking Hawaiian. All they cite is American presidents and the red, white, and blue Yankee Doodle Dandy. By the time it got to my parents, was already institutionalized. By the time it got to me at Kamehameha, I didn't know anything. Like, really, what happened? So, basically, all we had that took place since 1893 was a change in name, not in structure, not in government. So what was formerly the Hawaiian Kingdom, it was then called the Provisional Government. Instead of the monarch, it's called a president, but you still got the same branches of government. Then the provisional changed to republic, 1894. Then the republic changed to territory, 1900. 
Then the territory changed to State of Hawaii in 1959. Nothing changed but names. That's the mind-blowing part. And here we are trying to reinvent a wheel when in fact this is Hawaiian Airlines. And after 100 years, the paint on the outside is chipping off. And you got Swiss Airlines coming by, flying, and they see a few Swiss citizens in the window saying, help, I've been kidnapped, which was the basis of the Swiss case. So now other countries are now realizing this is not American Airlines. There's no merger. There's no contract. So you might say Hawaii was kidnapped, but it was treated like it was adopted. Can't find the adoption papers. Still kidnapped. So, according to Professor Crawford, another leading publicist, he says, there is a strong presumption that the state continues to exist with its rights and obligations, despite, despite revolutionary changes in government or despite a period in which there is no government. Right, he's speaking to the government can be gone, but that doesn't mean the country's gone. And he says, occupation does not affect the continuity of the state even when there's no government claiming to represent it which is what happened in Iraq during that time frame when the government was overthrown, Iraq still exists. So, separation of state and sovereignty, what Professor Croft was referring to, exercised by a government, the overthrow of the government did not mean the sovereignty is gone. Fully recognized throughout the world on international law. So, presumption of continuity. Hawaii in the 19th century was an independent state, no doubt. So presumably, Hawaii still is an independent state because international provides for the presumption. Now, presumption is different from assumption. Presumption is a conclusion based upon facts. Assumption is a conclusion based upon no facts. That's why when you assume, you make an ass out of you and me. Assume. You guys got that one? A colonel once told me that. Lieutenant, never assume because you make an ass out of you and me, you know. Go get the information. Presume is, is a conclusion based upon facts, but what it is, is a presumption is a legal term. What it does is it shifts the burden. So presumption of innocence. You guys remember the, the principle of presumption of innocence? That means if you're being prosecuted in a court, you are presumed innocent until proven guilty. What that means is the burden is not upon you to prove you innocent. The burden shifts on the prosecutor to prove beyond a reasonable doubt you're guilty. That's how it works. Because the presumption of innocence is you're presumed innocent because you have rights. That's all it means. Under international law, a country is presumed to still exist until proven extinguished. So who has the burden to prove the Hawaiian kingdom doesn't exist. The United States. Not the Hawaiian Kingdom. The Hawaiian Kingdom doesn't have to prove it exists. It exists. That's the presumption. That's what that meant. Right? And that's a very powerful position to be in. Because you're not asking anybody for approval. You're saying, I am. You tell me I'm not. Because I got my birth certificate, 1843. Show me I'm not. Where's, where's the adoption papers? No more. I'm still Keanu. Make sense? So, so I'm not presuming anybody here knows this, right? How many people here don't know this before you came in? Okay, that's why we're presenting this. So, uncle, we're presenting this for everybody, then we get to you. So, presumption of continuity is that the Hawaiian kingdom would still exist as a country unless the United States extinguished the Hawaiian kingdom under international law. That's when you got to find a treaty. And there is no treaty. Therefore, the Hawaiian Kingdom still exists. This is just getting into the frame of mind before you start moving. Because this will get you to the point. You're going to try to get the Hawaiian Kingdom recognized? Or is the Hawaiian Kingdom already recognized and you got to go this way? So it's a way of looking at a cup that is half empty or half full. Did you know you think differently when you see it that way? If the cup is half empty, you think no more water, you got to defend it. You get very defensive. Yeah? But if you say the cup is half full, you know where to get the water. Go fill them up. See, one is proactive, one is reactive. So before you move, you better know what you're talking about. 
That's the importance about knowing history. Now, the word for future in the Hawaiian language is kava mahope. Va o manava is time, mahope is backwards. Like imua, mamua, forward, ihope, backwards. So when you look it up in Mary Kavena Pukui's dictionary, future is the time of the past. So when you tell a Hawaiian, look to the future, he turns backwards. You guys ever saw the CD, Brother Is, Facing Future? That's Kavama Hope. All you see is his back. That's the concept. And I knew Brother Is at the time when he came out with that CD. But a lot of people didn't understand why is his back facing us. It's the concept facing future, Kavama Hope. That's why we need to understand what happened in order to know where to go. So that's what I'm going through now. Now, we're going to come to the test. How are you going to test this presumption? Because right now it's all theory. Right? It's all talk. The Permanent Court of Arbitration was created in 1899 under the Hague Convention, number one. Yeah. So this is the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Over here you have the International Court of Justice, and this is the Permanent Court of Arbitration. This court was created in 1945, United Nations. This was 1899, okay? Now, this court is gonna to have to deal with the presumption of continuity. You're gonna test it now, okay? So the Permanent Court of Arbitration is what is called an intergovernmental organization that creates ad hoc tribunals to resolve disputes, okay? So tri arbitration is, is where the people who have a dispute will agree to certain people to sit as arbitrators because they are experts in the area of this dispute as opposed to going to a sitting judge who may not be an expert and you gotta bring in expert testimony. In international relations, arbitration was the most sought after way of resolving disputes. That's why in 1899, the United States and a lot of countries, back then about 50 of them, agreed to create this organization to create tribunals to resolve disputes, hoping that the countries don't go to war. That's why the Permanent Court of Arbitration was created in 1899. Now, before the Permanent Court of Arbitration can create the tribunal to address a dispute, they gotta make sure it has what is called institutional jurisdiction. Not anybody can go to the Permanent Court of Arbitration. So the rules from the Permanent Court of Arbitration, you have a dispute between two or more states. So two states can go to arbitration. Here's a print of a case view from the permanent court. This is a case between Ecuador and the United States. In 2011, they went to the permanent court of arbitration. This is a dispute, but they identify the name of the claimant, which is like a plaintiff, the Republic of Ecuador. You notice it says state. United States of America, state. So before they could create the tribunal to address that dispute, they had to verify these two states exist today. The next type of uh, arbitration that they can take is between a state and an international organization, like an agency of the United Nations. And here's an example, Permanent Court of Arbitration Case Repository. This is between Peru, the municipality of La Punta, versus the United Nations Office on Project Services. You notice how it says the name of the claimant, La Punta is a state, UN is an international organization. So you, then they created the tribunal. Okay, but can you see the function of the court? That's its function, right? It can also hear disputes between a state and a private party. A state and a private party. This is the case I was a part of at the Permanent Court of Arbitration. Larson versus Hawaiian Kingdom. Okay, dispute between Lance Paul Larson, a Hawaiian subject against the government of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Okay, name of claimant, Lance Larson, private entity, name of respondent, Hawaiian Kingdom, state. They verified Hawaii as an independent state because they couldn't find any evidence that it wasn't. So you need to understand the rules of how it plays, how it plays out in order to make a play. 
And how they did this was I was the lead agent for the Hawaiian Kingdom at the Permanent Court of Arbitration. So the case started November of 1999 and went until February of 2001. Okay. From November of 1999 until February of 2000, the Permanent Court of Arbitration did not create the tribunal yet because they're still looking into whether or not the Hawaiian Kingdom still exists as a state. They have to. So I got a call from the Secretary General of the court, and he says, Mr. Sai, in order to maintain the integrity of this case, that's the words he used, he recommended that I travel to Washington, D.C. to provide a formal invitation to the United States State Department to join in the arbitration. I said, oh, that's a good idea. Because what I'm doing is I'm calling the bluff. See, now I know how to play poker. We got Royal Flush. All this time, we thought we was playing Go Fish, 51 Pickup, Old Maid. Now I'm like, bro, we playing poker. I'm going to call the bluff. So I went up to Washington, D.C. in March, had a meeting on March 3rd, 2000, together with the attorney representing Lance Larson, Ms. Ninia Parks. And we had a meeting, and I basically provided the invitation to the United States to join in the arbitration, because if... You can prove the kingdom doesn't exist. Remember, they got the burden, right? Remember the presumption? If you can prove the kingdom doesn't exist, show it. Then this case is over. And then I probably will brought up on treason under American law because I'm trying to break away. Oh, no. Who's never part of the United States? This is occupation. So that's when he started to watch his P's and Q's because he knew our conversation was going to be reduced to writing and recorded with the Permanent Court of Arbitration. That very next, that day after the meeting was Paul, laid it all out, emailed it to the registry of the court, and sent a copy to John Crook from the US State Department. This is what we talked about. We provided the offer. Three days later, must have been what, March 6, the American Embassy in the Netherlands, in The Hague, notified the court that they have no intention of joining the arbitration let alone stopping the case. And all they asked permission from the Hawaiian government and Lance Larson to have access to the pleadings. And of course, we gave it to them. That very next month in April of 2000 is when the tribunal was created to address this dispute that the Hawaiian government was alleged to be negligent for allowing American laws to be imposed in Hawaii. That's the subject of the dispute. And a lot of people thought, oh, the Permanent Court of Arbitration did not recognize the Hawaiian Kingdom as a state. No, no, this is proof positive it did, because if it didn't, we wouldn't have even gotten to the arbitration. All of that is part of the way you play the game. But what's interesting, I came home, and I'm trying to explain to people what happened, and they're trying to tell me that's not what happened. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm serious. I'm like, wow, really? Yeah, yeah. I know what goes on, because I know international law. Really? After I said, brother, you know what, I gotta go get that master's degree and deal with education at the top level, because everybody is affected by this misinformation. And basically, that became the foundation to move forward, because no longer can you say, oh, Keanu said. No, the Permanent Court of Arbitration said it. And I know that case very well, like the back of my hand. So. This was the case in the Netherlands when it went and the tribunal was created. That's me over there with the beard, trying to look distinguished, try to act like I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> and you know the guy Crawford, who was the publicist that speaks to expert, his expertise on, on the continuity of a state? That's him right there. He was the presiding judge in the arbitration. Two of the, judge, two of the arbitrators in the Permanent Court of Arbitration now sit as judges on the International Court of Justice and they know about Hawaii. So all these things are taking place, but the bottom line is education. Education. Don't talk. No. Yeah. Arbitration award issued by the Arbitral Tribunal. Okay. Cambridge Law Journal. It says, a perusal of the material, this is what the court says, a perusal of the material discloses that in the 19th century, the Hawaiian kingdom existed as an independent state 
recognized as such by the United States of America, the United Kingdom, and various other states. So in the arbitration award, it basically said the birth date of Hawaiian independence, 19th century. The acknowledgement of the continuity of the Hawaiian Kingdom as a state permanent court of arbitration that created this tribunal. But you notice the word independent? That means the laws that apply here. So American laws that apply in Hawaii since the 19th century to the present are all illegal under international law because of independence. And this, again, is independence, the laws. Right now, we don't know the laws. We, don't even, we can't even cite the civil code or the criminal code. We just talk. This is very, very complex, and that's why we got to be careful. So what we do at the university, get educated. Okay? I share with the, uh, bring it to a close now. So I share with my students. Okay? I, I, I refer to a kahui vai, the water gourd. It's a olelo no eel, a Hawaiian proverb. So the kahui vai is the water gourd that looks like a ipu with a long neck, yeah? like a water canteen. And it has a, a, a shell that's the cork. So this water gourd, according to the Hawaiian proverb, this water gourd represents the person. Water in the gourd represents knowledge. The gourd with a little bit of water makes the most noise when you shake it. You guys got that one? So when you hear swishing, when you hear anger, when you hear frustration, what are you supposed to do? Fill up the gourd. Go get water. Fill the gourd. That's what this whole thing is all about. It's not about grab one sign and stand up and coo air. No, no, no. Get educated. Normalize the conversations. When you speak of occupation, don't make it like you're proving it. Normalize it. And I can tell you, from when I first entered the University of Hawaii back in 2001 until today, the language and conversations have been normalized. Back then, you say occupation, what? No, no, we colonized, no. Today, you don't know that? So the truth comes in three stages. First stage, ridiculed. Second stage, violently attacked. Third stage, oh what, you never know, self-evident. I think we're in a stage three, because this thing is really moving forward. And with that, I want to just say mahalo, so I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Shane, and then we'll take it from there with question and answers.
with its sin of annexation. And the sale of native civil rights. The government's sums of money. We are satisfied with our stone. The astonishing food of the land. who has won the rights of the land. And now we tell the story again of the people who love their land. We will not rest until we have our lands.